HL7 and Fire are two different ways of communicating healthcare information. In both cases, we are dealing with a client-server architecture, but there are fundamental differences in the way the information is structured and transmitted. HL7 is based on the notion of events. An event, such as an admission, will trigger the creation of a message, which will itself contain segments with information on the patient, the institution, the appointment, etc. The message is transmitted to the server, which will pass the information and decide what to do with it. Then, it will generate an acknowledgement message, which will be sent back to the client. Fire, on the other hand, is based around resources. Resources are directly related to the way the information is stored in the database and are exchanged using standard HTTP requests. An admission event could, for instance, be seen as an encounter and the client will send a create encounter request to the server, which will answer with a standard HTTP confirmation. If the encounter concerns a patient which is not yet known to the database, another request might be sent with a patient resource in the same way. The main difference here is that the FIRE requests are directly linked to specific database operations and use standard communication protocols, which means that a FIRE server will generally be much easier to set up than an HL7 server. The core concepts of FIRE are therefore the resources and the interactions. Resources are all the different entities, events and operations which might be recorded in a medical information system. It includes individual information such, such as the patient or practitioner, organization information for the hospitals or departments, or events and workflow information such as appointments, diagnostic, reports, or invoices. Interactions define the different operations which can be done with the data, such as create, read, update, delete, or search. Let's take a look at what a search request would look like. An HTTP request is composed of a method and a URL. For a search request, the method will be GET. The URL has different parts. First, the base URL defines where the fire server is located on the internet or intranets. Then, we find the name of the resource on which the operation should be executed. Finally, we have the parameters of the search operation. This HTTP request could therefore be summed up, summed up as search for patients on the given server where the name is Smith. The server will respond with a bundle of resources, encoded in XML or JSON, and containing all the patient resources corresponding to the search. The main interactions all take place in similar ways, using different standard HTTP methods. The create operation is done with a post request to which is attached a resource. The server will store the resource and assign an ID to it. To read this resource, we can send a GET request to the server with the assigned ID and retrieve the resource. The PUT method allows us to update a resource by sending the modified resource and providing the ID. The corresponding resource on the database will be updated with the new information. The DELETE method allows us to remove a resource. Finally, as we've already seen, we can also use the GET method to perform a search operation by using search parameters instead of the ID in the URL. Let's now have a look at the test server of the University Health Network. This server implements all fire operations in the test environment where anyone can access, create, edit or delete information. If we go to a resource, like the patient, the interface allows us to build fire requests. Let's for instance try to search for all patients named Smith. The test server gives us a lot of information about what happens in the fire query. First, we have a bit of code that we could use in the Java client to create the same query that we just sent. This is a very useful tool when developing a fire client. Next, we can see the requests. We perform the search query, which is done as an HTTP GET. In the request, we see first the URL of the fire server, then the name of the resource, and finally the search parameters. The response is a status 200, which for HTTP means success. We can then see in the response the result of the search with clickable links. 
we should note that this page does a lot more than a simple fire request and response. The test server adds all of this easy to read interface to make it human readable. The fire communication is typically done between two computers and doesn't need all of this. If you follow the link of the request, you can get a direct access to the fire server. And by clicking on raw JSON, we only keep the part of the operation that would really happen in a real world situation. You can use the developer console from Chrome to look more closely at what happens. If we reload the page in the network view, we can see the query we just sent. We have access to the full HTTP communication, which with the requests and response headers. Under preview, we can pass the JSON response to see the structure of the bundle that we received. We see that the bundle is composed of a list of entries. In each entry, we find a resource, which is of the type patient and contains all of the information uh, whose name corresponds to the search criteria. We can also choose to get this information in the XML format, in which case, by default, the XML will be saved as a file to the disk. The XML will contain the exact same information as the JSON. In the next video, we'll see how to implement FIRE requests in our Java client.